So to talk about half-life, I'm going to use this graph here. We've got the activity count per second. So if you imagine those nuclei breaking down and releasing alpha or beta or gamma radiation, it's completely random when they do it. So if you have these, for example, it might be this one that decays or this one that decays. The actual decay process is completely random. I'm just going to introduce something called half-life which is the average time it takes for the number of nuclei, so there's radioactive nuclei, in a sample to halve. So for example, if here we had a sample of nuclei, it would be the time it takes for those number of nuclei to halve. And that is half-life, okay? And we'll see it in terms of this graph over here. So, for example, here you might see it in counts per second. That just means we're detecting the radiation and seeing how active a radioactive sample is. So we can use one of those Geiger Miller tubes to detect, if this is our sample, how much radiation it's giving off. So if we're looking at beta radiation, for example, we're counting how much beta radiation, so how much electrons hit this Geiger Miller tube every second. So this graph says the amount of um, activity per second. So over here we've got start off with 80 and at our half-life we need to halve the number of nuclei in the sample or halve the activity count. So we'd go across here at 40 because that's half of 80 and we go down and we'd find that our half-life was six days. It takes six days for the number of radioactive nuclei in the sample to halve. And if you went on again, you could halve 40 to 20. And between here and here is another six days. You may also be asked it in word form like this rather than the graph. So the reactivity of an isotope is 300 becquerels. 120 minutes later, it had fallen to 75 becquerels, which was 120 minutes later. Um, what is the half-life? So by this way, we'd go half of 300 is 150, and then to halve that again, we'd get 75. So even though it takes 120 minutes to get from 300 to 75, our half-life would be 60 minutes. So just moving on here to nuclear equations. Now this is for high tier. Alpha decay first of all. We can write this as a nuclear equation which you'd need to complete for the higher tier paper only. So if you are foundation then feel free to listen through but just bear in mind you won't have to do these for the exam. So here you have your radioactive sample, your radioactive um, nucleus and that is going to decay to release an alpha particle which if you remember is a helium nucleus so that is where the numbers four and two are coming from the alpha particle is a helium nucleus so this one's quite simple when you look at the numbers if you've got a mass of 219 you are going to lose a mass of four so the elements that you make must have a mass of 215. Again, the proton number is going to decrease by two because you are getting rid of that alpha particle that has two protons. Therefore, your proton number is going to be 84. So, in this example, you've got this radioactive element, radon, decaying into polonium and releasing an alpha particle. So this one's pretty straightforward, you just need to take away the 4 and take away the 2. Now this one will answer the question about where the electron came from in the nucleus. Because we have here carbon-14, a radioactive sample of carbon, and in beta decay, you emit an electron. So we put this number here as a negative 1 for the beta particle coming out, because it's, it's not a proton, so we put negative 1, and it will come clear why in a minute. Here the carbon um, isotope here, 14, will decay and release a, um, a beta particle or an electron. And when it does, it turns into nitrogen. But here's why. 
Look here at the mass. The mass stays the same. But the proton number increases by one. So the mass stays the same, but the proton number increases. And the reason um, that it does that is this, which will blow your mind a little bit from what you've been taught before. So hopefully you remember that in the middle of the nucleus, you've got protons and you've got neutrons. And around the outside, you've got electrons. Electrons have a negative charge, protons have a positive charge, and neutrons have no charge. This is because neutrons have no charge because essentially all they are is a proton with an electron embedded in them. Okay, that's why they have no overall charge because essentially they've got their plus one and their minus one, so they've got no overall charge. That also helps explain why if you look at the mass of those particles, a proton has a relative mass of one, so does a neutron, and electron we just write very small. So if you remember this new fact here, that actually a neutron is just a proton with an electron embedded in it, you will realize that um, when this decays, you will end up with the electron being released. So this electron here, for example, will be released in the decay, and therefore you will be left with a proton. So what happens is the mass doesn't change, but the proton number increases, because what happens in beta decay, essentially, is that a neutron turns into a proton when an electron is released.